So Yeoman's pretty cool. I'm not talking about Yeoman, but we use Yeoman actually quite a bit, and I'm going to be using it up here um, because I really like building software, and I like building good software. Um, and I really love coding, but the only thing I like to do more than coding is not coding. I'd, I'd much rather have stuff done for me uh, than, than have to do it like artisanally by hand every time, which is terrible. Um, so first things first, I'm giving a talk on, on back-end development and sales, although you'll see something called trails here, which I'll explain. But first, uh, I'm going to talk about UX. I flew here on Delta. All right, so I'm looking at my phone in the car on the way to the airport, and my flight, my flight was supposed to leave at 12.40 to come here. Now, from a UX perspective, you, like, your eye is drawn to like, the large fonts kind of in the center. My flight was indeed 3654. Um, however, I open up my app and I see this, and I, and I kind of freak out. I'm like, what? 10.07? Like, it's now 11.17. I'm screwed. Um, except even though in giant font you see this, in micro font, this is the plane flying to Norfolk from here, not the other way around. So in fact, I did not miss my flight, um, but I nearly had a heart attack uh, on the way to the airport. So if you're, if you're in front end design or if, you, like, if you're a UX person, don't ever do this. Don't ever freak out your users <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and make them, <laughs> like missing a flight is one of those, like missing other things, you know, um, is okay. Missing a flight is like, Totally irreversible. Do you have blunts turned on, like screen colors? Uh, I might. I don't actually, it's off on here, but it, it looks like it's messing with it on there. Let me, I'm going to quit it. By the way, it's Oh, that's way better. Yeah. Nice, good call. Um, was anybody at JSConf December? Anybody? No? Anybody going to ReactConf in San Francisco? Man, am I just a conference junkie? Yeah. OK. <laughs> All right, I'm going to actually do what I was, I'm supposed to do here. All right. This is kind of a bait and switch, but I'll, I'll, it'll be worthwhile. API-driven development with trails.js. And it's not an April Fool's Day joke either. That's when we call it fails. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm actually talking about something called trails. It's very similar to sales. Um, perils of scheduling talks way in advance. Um, I, uh, we scheduled this like two or three months ago. Since then, we, the original talk, and I've given this talk several times now on sales. It's in a modified form here now, uh, now that I'm talking about trails. The story there is, we were talking on sales and doing this promotion thing for moving towards sales 1.0. Uh, it's in 0 0.12 now. It's currently in RC. And we're building all these features to get it to 1.0. And we decided that the best way actually to get it to 1.0 status, actual like solid, stable, um, the modern frame, web framework that we want it to be, uh, we actually sort of have split off from the project and are creating a new project called Trails, which is going to, and our, our goal is to have that embody all the things that we wanted Sales 1.0 to be. Um, Trails has a lot of benefits. At the end of the day, it does a lot of the same things, which I'm going to talk about uh, once I get into some of the, I have a couple slides, and I'll do some coding, very similar um, to the previous uh, lightning talk, um, which I guess, yeah, I guess 23 minutes is, is long, but it, it didn't seem like it was that long. Uh, and we'll go from there. So. This isn't, you know, this, this line across sales, right? This isn't like, you know, death to sales or something. Um, sales is, is still good, but our work on trails is sort of our sort of our modern evolution of sales. Um, it's a total rewrite. It's not a fork. It's not a, a plus plusing the version number. Um, it's, it's pretty new. It takes advantage of a lot of the new JavaScript features also that are, that are coming out. Okay, this is me. Um, 
you can contact me if you want. I'm on, I'm on around GitHub. Hopefully all you guys are on GitHub. I co-organized Norfolk JS. This is the Norfolk JS Ninja Cat. Um, you can't see, but there's a little mermaid here, which is, and it actually says Norfolk, but it's super low resolution there right now um, because of the projector. But um, if you ever want to come talk at Norfolk JS, let me know. We will we'll try to accommodate you however we can. We have out of town speakers occasionally as well, and it's it's nice to meet new folks and have new people speak at the group. In the category of upcoming events, also, we're th we're throwing a like, kind of a larger conference, not you know larger than a user group, but not quite like a a national thousand per person conference. Um, we're looking to have an attendance of like 200-ish people at Revolution Conf in Virginia Beach. Um, we're also, there's call for speakers is open on that as well. Uh, if you need help covering travel costs and you want to speak there, there are opportunities for that. So if you want to speak there and if you want to start your summer early uh, in Virginia um, in May, it's probably still snowing here or something, I don't know. Uh, then does it stop snowing? God, it's so cold here. Uh, um, oh, it's yeah, it's warm, right? I, I could tell it's when it, yeah, I could tell it's warm when I started shivering. Um, yeah, so come to Revolution Conf. Uh, contact me. Um, go to the website revolutionconf.com and uh, and check it out. Like I said, if you want to speak, you get accepted. Uh, there's a lot of help we can provide with getting you there. That means, that means free stuff, free airfare and hotel, possibly. OK, so here we go. What is Trails? So this is a similar, again, these slides are similar. If you've, if you've seen my other talk with sales um, that's kind of floating around on the internet, this is sort of similar. But Trails is a modern Rails-like fr framework for Node, uh, similar to the Yeoman talk. Trails uses Yeoman to generate a lot of its components, uses to generate the application itself, set up the scaffolding, and generate controllers, models, services, things like that within the application so that you don't have to write all that code yourself. It's, um, yes, it's very buzzword compliant. Uh, it's, it's easy to learn. Hypermodular, what does that mean? I don't know, I made it up for this slide. Uh, it, Trails is super small, so it's this, it's this tiny, tiny nucleus with um, a bunch of modules that orbit around it, and the essence of the framework is really in the modules and the relationships to the core, not in some giant monolithic core itself. That's one of the things that we changed. Um, we're changing between sales and trails. And sales tries to give tries to give you everything up front. Here's like here's here's tons of code and stuff, and it's great. But once you need to try to start customizing it, swapping in your own modules, extending it. Uh, things get kind of difficult. Um, upgrading dependencies turns out to be really difficult. So we're trying to use some of those lessons learned on the technical side of, of maintaining sales um, for, for the past year and a half now and apply it to some of these improvements in trails. It's ES6 all the way down. Raise your hand if you are using ES6 all the time, everywhere, forever, and in production. Ah, lots of hands started going down. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but ES6 is awesome. Uh, if you haven't started using it, you should. It runs native in Node now. You don't actually have to use Babel. A lot, I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, not all of the ES6 features are supported in Node 4 and 5, but like all the, most of the good ones are. Uh, most of the things that actually make your life easier and aren't just like syntactical, like hipster magic. Uh, like generators, come on. Really? Generators are really just like a, they're just like the stepping stone to async await, which is actually going to be really cool. But um, yeah, ES6 everywhere. The code is super clean and readable. It, we, incur, we had an ES lint module that we encourage you to write your, your application and your um, extensions also in ES6. Try to make that easy as possible. Um, extensions, we have this concept called trail packs, which I'll talk about once I start um, getting into some code. Hey, question. Yes, we are. We this was brought to our attention uh, actually a few week, a weeks ago. Apparently, there's some old Java framework 
that it was called Trail. I think it's defunct now. Um, I don't think it's any longer maintained. The creator moved to YouTube, actually. Okay, that sounds appropriate. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of it um, until like somebody on Twitter was like, "Hey, like, there, a Trails already exists." And it's like some Java framework from 2004. Uh, I, I feel pretty safe like reusing the name. I think <laughs> at this point. So right, we wanted to maintain like the eponymous Rails, Grails, Sales sort of thing because it's catchy, it's easy to remember, um, and it, the, the goal overall is to make your life easier and provide you with convention so that you don't have to like make the same, like debate the same decisions over and over as you're building up your project, right? Because like you want to focus on business logic, you want to like be arguing in your, within your team on like whether you want to use semicolons or not, or like how to structure your directories. Um, ultimately, it doesn't like my opinion, personal opinion. Ultimately, like a lot of that stuff doesn't actually matter. It's just that you need something that everybody can like just submit themselves to and believe in and have everybody on the same page and enforce consistency. So, all right, got my screen back. I guess my laptop likes to go to sleep. Another really cool thing about Trails, which this is actually pretty unique um, in the Node.js space right now, is that we don't actually pick back to the unopinionated part and the buzzword buzzword bullet. Uh, we don't pick a web server for you. We don't pick a data store for you. Um, currently, we ex support Express Express Four and Co and and Happy. We're working on Coa. Um, currently, for the ORMs, we support Waterline, which was the ORM that was included in Sales. Uh, Waterline is pretty good. It supports like two dozen databases, which like all the ones that you've heard of and will probably use, plus a lot that I've, I've never heard of, and but people seem to like. So um, it's a, an adapter-based ORM. So you can, if you have your own pet database that you want to work with it, you can write your own adapter for it. So we released 1.0 alpha on Friday, which was really, um, <laughs> aside from cutting it kind of close, uh, for this talk, it's uh, the the API for Trails is set. So that's what we're our focus now is moving toward uh, 1.0 release in April. Um, we we feel pretty good about s we're starting to use Trails for projects based on the alpha. Um, it's we're not going to be running it in production tomorrow, but the goal is for 1.0 in April to be fully production ready. You can run, you know, your horizontally scalable Heroku magic with it, and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, it's going to be, again, it's a, a lot of the production level stuff is is using a lot of the same technologies that Sales did. So, question. What's your LTS term? The LTS term is on our uh, repository on our roadmap. Essentially, it's it the the terms of the LTS, and the reason it's being released in April is that we're using the same LTS guidelines as Node is. So Node is doing releases in April and October, and we're going to be mirroring those. Okay, so I, I hadn't have I didn't have enough memes in my slides yet, so I had to put some in. Um, the goal of Trails is to make your life easier, uh, and there are plenty of tools also in Node and other languages. Like if you're if you want to have like a really high like hello worlds per second. Um, then like you can you can use I don't know Meteor or something, uh, or I don't know some some other like some other framework that you can get off the ground super fast like zero to you know hello world in in, eight, in fifteen seconds right, uh, but Trails is really trying to provide a better follow through like into production into long term development and maintenance building teams around it uh, within your organization. Uh, things like that, and so like don't don't use it to build a website for your cat. There are better things you can use it for. But it's also not it's not going to help you do anything that Node can't do. So Node can't like help you with building laser guided missiles because no no developer knows how to do that. Uh, you're going to have some just it's never been done. Um, there's not the institutional knowledge there. So Trails doesn't it's not magic. It just helps you do the things that you are going to do anyway helps you accelerate towards solving actual business problems rather than like fooling around with your framework. Pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. 
API-driven development is rapid prototyping for the back end. The whole goal of this framework, this talk, uh, the things that we do in our company, we try to match our tools with our development process. And basically that means uh, we know, both as a consulting firm, and also I've worked as an employee, many of you are employees in some corporation, and you have bosses and managers and stakeholders and product owners and business analysts and all these people, um, you, like when you start building stuff, you don't actually know what it's gonna end up looking like down the road, like months or years. If you think you do, you're probably wrong and you're probably making a lot of mistakes based on that wrong assumption. The, the goal with frameworks like this is to allow you to iter iteratively prototype in approximately the right direction, but at the same time not like uh, ensconce yourself in this corner underneath a bunch of barbed wire of like terrible demo code uh, that you can't ever get out of. Um, that's, that's like so many projects uh, end up in this fate. Even in like modern, modern Node.js, uh, like happy land, you, you start writing code and you end up in this terrible place because every week like somebody wants to demo something somewhere to somebody and you end up always just coding for the demo and then you end up and they're like, okay, so like we're ready to re release this now, right? Because we just had the string of successful de demos. And then the engineers are looking at, like, they're like, what are you talking about? We have to rebuild this whole thing because we've just been doing demo stuff for the past year. Uh, and it's, it, tries to, it tries to bring sanity a little bit to, to a lot of those types of problems. The goal is to build your backend endpoints as you go. And in this way, test-driven development fits really nicely into that. You build a, 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 a backend endpoint, you define some you know, domain object, uh, you know, the, the framework generates you a nice path between client, uh, you know, your browser, to through REST interface, to middleware, to over to the database. And you get this nice plumbing uh, already set up for you once you start using the framework. And so the second you decide, I want a model called this, you can start testing that it does what you think it should do. It plugs in pretty easily with things like Swagger. You guys use Swagger? How many times people use Swagger for documentation? Eh, yeah, okay. It's, Swagger is really cool. Um, their approach is they wanna be able to do this bidirectional translation between like sort of Knuth literate programming, like I wanna just write a paragraph of what my program does and it turns it into a program. And in the other way, you write your program and it generates documentation for it. And Swagger does both directions. We're using it for the, you build your program and then it generates docs for you. And that's actually a really cool use case for it. Uh, I haven't, I don't have much experience with the other direction. Uh, works well with agile development process. That, that's sort of what I talked about earlier with the rapid prototyping. That's, that's all the slides I have. Um, I'm gonna actually code now, which is gonna be really fun because Coding live is always fun. You never know what's going to happen. So what I want to drive home here basically is show setting up a Trails app, making it do something kind of real, and then that's it. Uh, it you, know, you guys can ask questions. We can discuss things. If you guys have questions as I'm going or if you like, can't see the screen or something, let me know. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have this be as collaborative as you want it to be. So I'm gonna zoom in slightly. Is that big enough? Let's get crazy. Oh yeah, all right. Oh geez, it's way bigger on my screen right here. Okay. <laughs> so what, what do we wanna do? First I'm gonna open up Postman. You guys use Postman to to test your REST interfaces and play around with stuff? I see nodding heads, what about hands? Oh, okay, everybody, great. Um, Postman is actually written in sales. So that's, uh, that's a cool little, impress your friends with, with that nugget of trivia. Um. So what I've done is, uh, so we use Yeoman. I've already generated like a really s simple example app with nothing in it uh, because at the end, it npm installs a lot of stuff, and I'd like to not wreck the Wi-Fi uh, up here. So this is a, a new app. Um, I'm going to run npm start, and.
And it gives me, OK, it, this, is, this is nothing. It says, I've loaded, and here's some like, basic info about your application. Let's make it do something. So as I mentioned earlier, everything is loaded in through trail packs. I can go to my config and see currently there's two trail packs loaded in, core and REPL. REPL was the nice little interactive thing that you saw a second ago um, that I didn't really play with. Um, but uh, probably we're going to be building a web application of some sort. So we can, we can just include more trail packs. And due to the magic of the framework, they figure out how they need to load. Um, this list is the, the comment here. The list is unordered. The reason is that the trail packs themselves define which preconditions and postconditions they need and emit. These are in the form of Node.js events, conveniently. And during runtime, the runtime Trails runtime system figures out, based on which events each one of these trail packs produces and consumes, which order they need to load in. So you don't actually have to care about that up front. Um, the definition of each trail pack allows the system to determine this. So essentially, you, you, get, you have a bunch of trail packs, you throw them all in a pile, and then they, they figure out how they need to execute. So Waterline is this nice ORM that I talked about earlier. Um, there's, a, there's another one. So we're loading Happy, because Happy is good, and a good web server. And then um, Router, which will turn all of my controllers and models into REST endpoints for me and feed them into uh, Happy. Happy is a web server. Um, so Happy is a, it was written by Walmart uh, two or three years ago. Um, Happy famously ran a lot of Walmart's Black Friday traffic um, in 2014. And that's sort of where its popularity uh, came from. So it has a small but like sort of strong kind of cultish following. Uh, and it's, it's, pr it's a pretty good, pretty good tool. So it's, it's in the category of like Express and Koa uh, in that it's a node web server that allows you to easily define routes um, in your application and have those routes turn into REST endpoints in your, uh, that are exposed to the client. So we added some trail packs. I'm going to restart this. OK, so it says everything's loaded again. Let me, I'm going to change the log level so that we can make things a little more interesting. Um, use Winston. I'm going to set this to debug. OK, I got a lot more output that time. So these are all the trail packs that are loaded. These are all the events that they're firing. Uh, all this isn't too important right now. And this is like the, this is the console. So this, this interactive console thing that I'm playing with, like here, is the REPL trail pack, um, which is, gives me a nice little interpreter to, to mess with. So I can, I can inspect my application during runtime pretty easily uh, using this. It's good for just hacking and debugging um, and things. So what do we've got? Let's see. I think I have a controller set up. Is that legible? Rem kind of. A little bit. OK, so I just made a get request um, to slash, OK, it's running on port 3000. I made a get request to API slash v1 slash default slash info. And it's just give, it's spitting out some stuff. OK, so I'm running node 5.4. Um, this is like, if you've done PHP, it's like a PHP info kind of output. Just some basic thing. OK, and then like, these are the trail packs that I've loaded. Little bit, little just kind of debug, uh, debug output here. The reason that happens is because I have a controller called default controller. And then it just replies. The reply is a happy, this is a happy uh, API. 
It replies with the output of this function, which is in some service that I wrote. So a lot of you weren't using, uh, weren't using ES6. If you're not using ES6, this makes no sense. This is weird. Why is our, is this Java? What is this, and this? Um, so all of my API resources in Trails are actually just ES6 classes. Kind of cool. During runtime, I just, the system just looks at what type of thing these are. This is of type controller. And that's how it figures out how to load all this stuff up. So this is a controller. Um, it doesn't care where your stuff is. So unlike uh, sales and, and some other frameworks, you have, you have to, your stuff has to be in certain folders. Um, by default, everything is laid out this way with trails. And the generators do put them in some default locations. But ultimately, um, if you want to get wild and structure your application however you want, you can do that. It matters what type of thing it is. So this is super simple. Now, the reason that REST endpoint existed is because Trails generates those for me. Uh, this, this thing, that's kind of hard to see, but um, slash default slash info. So default controller will have its own namespace right here. And then this method is called info. Just generates that endpoint for you. And I can, I can just sit there and create more methods like that, and they'll be exposed on the REST interface. Um, this is configurable through, um, you know, in here. You can, you can pretty granularly decide what stuff you want to show up. This is called, we call them footprints. We think it's kind of cute because in sales, um, this idea of generating REST endpoints from your controller methods are called blueprints. Um, but we're in the woods now. Calling them footprints, kind of, kind of cheesy. But question. V one is URL. Where is that Sorry. V one is URL. The V one, yes. Uh, that's in the footprints config, actually. So I just, I just put that there because um, for fun. But that prefix down there, you can set all your all your routes to be prefixed by something if you want to. If you don't, you can just you can set this to you know you can set this to nothing. So these verbs here, where it says models and then options, um, the options are how you want to display your responses. And then in actions, this is where you say, this is actually for the models. When I create a model, I'll, I automatically want all of these actions exposed as footprint endpoints. For the controller we looked at, this same, um, config can be applied here, but I'm just, I'm just having it all set to true. So for example, if I wanted to get granular about it, this would be an object with some, you know, with some config in here. Uh, so we can, we can spell. This is live coding. All right. So this is the config. We can, we can talk more about the configs later. Um, but you, you do have some options as to which things you want to expose automatically and which things you don't. Um, if I want to change the name, so in this case, I actually have this configured in my routes config. I can get super granular by going in here, and I can, I can set this to something else if I want. You know, I can change this value. Um, this, this doesn't need to be here. I can delete that, and it'll, it'll still come up. But this is here for clarity. Um, if, if you've used happy, you'll notice that this object looks a lot like a happy route config object, because it is. Easy, easy to remember. Um, yeah, tra trails, you know, we have to pick some, a, a couple things to base uh, some of our ideas around. We try to, as often as possible, we try to base some of these concepts around modules that already exist. I don't like reinventing the wheel, even though I'm building a new framework. I want to make use of as much of your existing knowledge as possible as, as, as node developers. So let's, let's do something slightly more interesting. Let's make a model. 
Let me clear this so this moves to the top. Yo, we're doing yeoman. That's fun. I'm going to create a model called user. This is going to do exactly what the previous talk did. It's going to ask me some questions. What is your model description? What, what does your user do? Uh, this is like a user account object. OK. And it tells me what it did. It created this file. So let's crack it open. Another ES6 class. Simple, empty. It's our job to add stuff in here. We can leave config alone for now, but this is how you would, um, for example, in here, you can have your own model config in this section. And here, you can override configurations per model. But we don't have to deal with that right now. Let's, uh, users should have a username, probably. Um, if you're familiar with waterline, you're familiar with this syntax. Uh, I'm, I'm just creating, essentially, defining a waterline model. If you use some other ORM, this definition will look like the syntax of some other ORM. Uh, SQLize and, and Bookshelf sort of both look similar uh, in, in this convention, but this happens to be a waterline model because that's the trail pack I have installed. That's also the one that I personally know the best, so I can it's, it's really good to give talks on things that you know what, when you know what you're doing. Um, so OK, so this user has a username. Great. Let's uh, fire trails back up. Let's go back to Postman and play with this for a second. So oh, I want it bigger, not smaller. OK. Here I'm doing the same thing where uh, I'm just doing slash user. This is going to, I'm, I'm sending a get request. So this is just going to get all the users. All right, you know what? Change my mind. I'm going to make this smaller again. Sorry about that. OK. So it returns an empty array because I don't have any users in the system yet. We can change that. So I can make a post request to that same endpoint. This is just restfulness, restful API. I'm sending a, as the body, I'm just sending a JSON object. The username is me because that's my favorite user is myself. So let's create this. All right, we got a response. Uh, username TJ Webb, that's me. That's the one I sent in. Generated an ID for me. That's nice. And then it time stamps some stuff. Waterline does this for me. It's good for debugging. All right, so I just created a user, right? So now if I run that same query I did a second ago where I, I try to get the list of users, it'll give me a list with one object in it. All right, great. We can do something slightly more interesting, though. OK, and here's Trails like logging out some stuff that I'm doing, because it's in debug mode. I, already, I also have another, um, let's go back to here, not here, user. And let's open up. I have another model here that I wrote called Web Token. So imagine a world where we actually want to authenticate people into our application. Crazy, I know. But we actually like don't want everybody to be able to access everything. So we use JWT um, because JSON Web Tokens are like the new hotness. And, um, and everyone wants to use JWT instead of sessions now, which that's fine. So it's actually good. Um, it, you know, the cookies have some known, like, uh, some known potential security issues. 
and also the EU, like I guess in the EU, don't browsers now have a, like a warning if you go to a site with cookies? The sites have to use the cookies. They have to what? Right, yeah, you have to opt into everything, which is like super annoying because like what, what can you even do without a session on a website anymore? Because um, every website is now a web application. So we're gonna use JWT, we're gonna implement some, uh, some authentication, super basic. So expiration scopes is like a, a list of stuff you're allowed to do, kind of, or a list of groups that you're in which might confer some p permissions on you. And then token is gonna to be our super secure uh, web token value. Well, we don't wanna just have tokens in a vacuum, right? We wanna associate them with these users somehow. So like this user should have a list of tokens that it can use uh, to authenticate itself. Because you know one token shouldn't just authenticate anybody. So tokens, be a, co a collection of web token all right, and on the web token itself, it'll have a user, model, user. I'm setting up a one-to-many relationship here in my, in my database. Um, this is just typical relational database stuff. And over here, I'm gonna say this is user. So this is, water, this is all waterline magic I'm doing right now, but this is basically saying, um, like web token dot user will lead me to my connect up my user object, and this is the user property on web token. Sorry, it's kind of at the bottom there. I'll move this stuff up. All I have to do now is I'll just restart my app. Go back here. Okay, so make the same get request. Get the same list. By the way, what's the obvious question here as I'm like, in, I restarted my app, my user is there, I inserted you, what's? Where's the data yes, where's the data stored? Um, you know, for this demo, it turns out it doesn't matter, but I'm actually, it, under the hood, I'm using a, a SQLite database. So that configuration is in, um, is in the database config for the application. So actually, since I'm in my console here, I'll just do, um, this, move it up. So, this is not helpful at all because it turned this into an object. But um, let, me, uh, let me go back to my config file really quick so you guys can believe what I'm doing here. So, again, Quick configuration. Adapter, waterline is an adapter based ORM. I'm plugging in the waterline SQLite 3 adapter. And uh, migrate alter is kind of cool. It just says to, uh, if you've changed the, the schema since the last time you started the server, just alter the schema to look like your new schema. So before, I would have had some table called user. I can dig into the SQLite command line thing if you want. Um, during Q&A, but uh, this basically says, every time you start up the application, diff the schema and figure out if anything changes. If it has, add whatever new columns or, or whatever you need to in order to um, make everything, everything line up. So we've got our app running, got our users here, and let's create a web token for a user because that's what we want to do. I'm going to change this ID. So I'm going to make a post request again. I'm going to send in a token, ABC123, because that's my super secure token. And then um, I'm going to make a post request to a new URL, slash user slash one, which is one is the ID of the user that I made earlier. Because it, when it, in my response it said ID one, and it turns out if I can just if I make a get request to sl user slash one, it would give me just that user. I can also post to it, and I can say I want to post to the tokens collection. 
on user one, and it'll just create a new token for that user. So I send this in. What I get back is the this is an actual web token response. So it created a web token. This is my ABC123. It expires 40 years ago. And this is the, the, the timestamps when it was created. Pretty simple. So now if I want to get the list of users in the database, and I want to see the tokens that are associated with them, I can just say populate equals tokens. And that's saying that user has a property called tokens, but tokens is a it's a relation. It's a, it's a, it, tokens are in a separate table somewhere. So I'm saying join the table together and then give me everything in one chunk. So now this is, the response is a list of users, username TJ Webb, but now all, the users also have this tokens property with, a lit, with an array of, of other tokens. This is, this is like, you know, really basic, uh, you know, if, if, some, if somebody came to me and said, hey, build a thing where I can have users and tokens and go, right? I would like, I would go through some process that looked kind of like this. Like, okay, a user has tokens. You prototype it out and you watch it work. And then you can go to them and say, okay, like, it works. Um, you know, it's not, certainly not done. Uh, but this is, this is so you can go through this process without, like, I wrote no actual code. I didn't do any work, actually. Like, I didn't use my brain hardly at all. Um, but I, I nonetheless got something, like, ostensibly done, which is, like, which is what people want to see. They want to see the appearance, um, you know, of progress. And, and that's certainly what this is. Now, it turns out that under the hood, you've actually done something very real in that I actually have this REST service that's actually returning this stuff, and I can actually post to it. Um, from this point, it's really just honing in on exactly what you want the API to look like, maybe tuning your routes config to make those, you know, these REST paths look slightly different. Maybe you have some other system you, are, you need to integrate with that requires some different, like, URL format, right? You can get to all that. In the meantime, you have something that works that you can um, sort of reason about as you, as you hone in on the actual problem you're solving. I'm going to spend two minutes talking about kind of a little bit about how the trail pack thing works so you can get a sense of, aside from this, like, okay, like, niftiness, I can create some objects and they're stored somewhere. Um, give you a little, like, a, a very minor technical dive on how the trail pack loading thing is working. And then that's, that's all I kind of wanted to cover, and I want to get your questions and, and your feedback on, on do you guys think this is useful, uh, what, what sorts of things that you would like to see, and just general sorts of questions. Happy to answer any question. So really quick, I'm going to dig into just one of the, by the way, oh, so OK, side note, <laughs> I'm using NPM3. Which, who's using NPM3 yet for actual stuff? You, your hand went up first, and now you're laughing. So um, this is what the, your node modules look like in NPM3. Uh, what, what is all that stuff? I don't know. All right, look, check this out. This is my package JSON. I have, like, I have like eight dependencies. My node modules folder has like 300 things in it. Um, yeah, it flattens everything. So now when you, when you look around in your node modules, you get, you get everything. There's no more hierarchical uh, storage of node modules. OK, side note over. Uh, what's that? It is slow. Yeah, they say they're working on that which is what I would say if I just put out a new version it was way slower than the old one. <laughs> so, all right, uh, what, am I, what am I even doing here? Okay, we're gonna go into, this is a, a, the, config, uh, the config file for the happy trail pack. This is kind of the, the magic I was talking about earlier. Uh, every trail pack defines their life cycle. And this life cycle, uh, every trail pack, when they're loaded, they have an, a very simple API, which is 
They have a validate function, a configure function, and an initialize function. If you've used sales.js at all, this will look like a sales hook similar, and a lot of other things too um, that load like this. But in this configuration, you can define which events that certain lifecycle stages require. So the initialize uh, lifecycle stage in the happy trail pack requires that this event is fired at some point. Uh, so it's going to wait for it. This allows us to, like, you, you can install your trail packs, and they can all kind of figure out how they need to work with each other. But you also don't have to, like, statically hard code your dependencies in your package JSON. The reason that's really important is because the, when you have a plugin based software framework, you have this like interdependent, like complex web of stuff where like happy trail pack might work with other stuff, but might not necessarily depend on it. So how do you actually like signify that in your package, Jason? It's impossible. NPM is designed to give you stuff you need, uh, not stuff that you don't need, but could use, but it, it's, it's not good at it, it, it sorting that out. So they tried actually with peer dependencies, which is kind of a, it's kind of a mess. So this, this allows you to avoid um, like dependency hell and a lot of other issues because even though you don't, you don't put it in your, NP, in your package JSON, your dependencies, we can statically analyze all these and determine in advance whether your program will execute. So it's actually like a, um, uh, it's, this, it's this nice way of determining whether your program is sort of like valid. It does like this validity check for your actual program. So trail packs really form the essence of the framework. So it's important that all the trail, trail packs know their relationship with other trail packs and so forth. Um, that's kind of complicated, but the important part there is that the framework doesn't doesn't have a lot of uh, like intelligence into resolving this stuff. Like the core, the, as an example, like the core framework of sales, something like fifteen thousand lines of code, which isn't terrible, but the core of Trails is like three hundred lines of code, because all it really is is like a module loading system. All the all the juice, all the good stuff in the framework is in the Trail packs. That's what, that's what we're trying to achieve there. I think, so I went through the coding thing. I just, I wanted to go through some kind of whiz bang thing to uh, show like the type of thing that is possible and what, in our view, what API driven development looks like. Like in practice, it's that process. Like I have requirements, I want to create some models. Um, that's really all I have to demo. So what I want to do now is turn it over to you guys. See if you have questions, um, thoughts, ask me, you know, Ask me anything you want. Um, if you want to not ask me anything and just go get drinks, that's that works too. But it's uh, want to see what you guys' thoughts are. Yeah. How would you pass a custom query for sort order? Custom query. So those are sort of two separate questions. Um, in this case, that's that's going to be determined by the features that the ORM trail pack exposes to you. In this case, the waterline trail pack. You do get, have the ability to send um, the the parameters are called uh, a limit and offset, uh, so you can send a limit equals whatever offset to do paging. And uh, custom queries, you you can to some extent do that uh, achieve that through the REST interface. For example, if I want to say user where like username equals TJ Web, I can do that. I can't send it SQL because that'd be crazy um, and, and terrible. Uh, but sure, I mean, you, you can imagine a world where there is some interface where you send some SQL-like language uh, to it. But I heard, I, I forget who said this, but um, some, I don't want to attribute to Martin Fowler, but it sounds like something he would say, where like SQL was designed expressly for SQL inje injection attacks. Uh, it's like the one thing it's good at. It's like it's <laughs> being able to inject SQL into itself. Um, but yeah, these are this is a sort of like simple kind of f filter you can add on to. With Mongo back end, I've seen a lot of people pass any Mongo queries. 
Yeah, um, back in like the genesis of Waterline actually is based around Mongoose. So one of the first, I think the first two adapters supported by Waterline were Mongo and MySQL. So a lot of the Waterline query syntax is actually based around Mongoose, which looks understandably like Mongo uh, query. But in general, you'll every ORM will support this kind of uh, convention where if you have, and this is this is also kind of typical REST. Most most REST uh, interfaces implement filtering similarly, where if you have a field, you say field equals this. That means I want to filter on that field, and so forth. You can also do some things um, like, uh, for example, again, if you want to say, you know, offset equals 100 and limit equals 1,000 or something, uh, you can send that type of stuff in. In the configuration, in here, there's a default limit set. So by default, it'll return up to 100 records. Other questions? Thoughts? You first. I did a little bit of work in sales. One of the things I tried to do was change the serialization so that you could use like Greenhorn API. Okay, yeah. I had a really hard time getting the calls to do that. Yeah. Is that something that's on to do with trail packs in sales? Serialization, serialization? Yeah, so one of the things we've done also, and in, in our view, one of the design deficits of sales is that it, it its hook system, it has a, actually a lot of framework logic in there that's based around controllers and, and models and manipulating them, but it doesn't do it through its standard, like uh, like it creates, it generates controllers, but it doesn't actually generate controllers, it generates like these weird hooks that run some custom logic before and after a controller. Um, in in Trails, for example, like the, the endpoints the, for all those, uh, like the slash user slash um, all that stuff is actually just a real controller called footprint controller, and so in that case, in that sense, you could actually just create your own controller, <laughs> um, like JSON API controller, for example. Actually, I should. One second, just do this. Did I do something wrong? Anyway, uh, I have a controller already. If, if you go in here, you could extend some other controller, possibly. So you could extend, like, for, you know. And, and then if you want to, um, you can require it, sort of like, uh, you can require it from whatever trail pack, which is in, in here. So, you have two options. You can extend individual controllers like sort of like this, or you can just write your own trail pack and achieve the same thing. And trail packs are also classes, so trail packs can inherit from other trail packs. Um, it, you don't have to, like the old kind of ES5 way is everything is a mix-in, and mix-ins work great for a lot of things. Um, for extending plugins, I don't think they work all that great. Um, and there's, I mean, I don't want to get into the whole, like, which type of inheritance should I use in JavaScript debate, but in my view, for this type of use case, classical inheritance works much better than prototypical, prototypal inheritance. Uh, there were other questions. You. Um, you know, on sales, uh, you use Express A. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is there a view layer? Uh, Trails doesn't care um, how you implement views. Uh, each trail pack will implement views however it needs to, and it'll use the um, it'll use this config file. There's a web.js config file. Um, trail packs can also add their own config files, but essentially, Happy, for example, will have a very different way, like technical way of rendering views. Express will have a different way of rendering views. But through configuration, you, you can configure like where your views live and things like that. 
so it all in, ends up being the same. At the end of the day, you're using some templating engine that's going to, that, interfacing with that is going to be the same regardless of which web server you're using. But um, the actual implementation will be different depending on which trail pack you're using. So yeah, Happy, I think, two, two plugins for Happy that we use, one of them is Vision and one of them is Inert, I think for doing static files and for doing, um, for doing views. I think that's the names of them. I don't remember exactly. But the, in the Express 4, we, so sales, first of all, sales is based on Express 3, which has its own sort of set of problems because Express 3 is end of life. Um, we're working on an Express 4 trail pack, which I actually haven't personally been super involved in. So I actually don't know how they're implementing views in that. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to follow the, um, the same convention for both either way. Because ultimately, it will depend on what templating engine you use. Other questions? Brian? How is, uh, how is real time enabled? Real time. Uh, currently, re there is no real time support uh, because we haven't built a trail pack for it yet. Um, th that's on our roadmap. So, again, there's like tons of stuff on our roadmap. Uh, real time is one of those. It remains to be seen which like, you know, WebSocket library we use and how we integrate with it. Um, but that's that's on the roadmap to be finished before 1.0 in April. Other questions? Yes. Sorry, so I don't really have a sales specific to ask, but like, how will they go about migrating this thing? Comparing it or, or migrating it? Yeah, migrating it, rewriting it. So we are we are working um, not very actively, but before 1.0 in April, we will have a trail pack. That we ha we've started writing a trail pack sales, which is a migration path from sales. So essentially, you'll, you'll be able to plug in an existing sales application, and it'll run inside of trails. And that actually is going to use, the reason we haven't gotten too far on that yet is because it requires the Express 4 trail pack to be finished and tested and everything. Um, and so that's, we intend for that to be a way to upgrade your sales app to run on Express 4, because right now it's on Express 3. And from our discussions with the core team, they're not very uh, motivated to upgrade from Express 3 at the moment. So that's, that might change, but for the time being. Are there, there were other questions? Yes. Uh, you mean in the in the, the trail. trail packs for the listening for events, right? So if, if one trail pack listens for an event from another one and it requires an event that right. this one fires, th that'll be detected and statically, and your app will error before it runs. So that you know, it's, this happens in two places. One is during post install for a trail pack. It looks at all the other trail packs that are currently installed, and says, "Do I think there's going to be an issue?" Um, and then secondly, during runtime, there's a timeout. For, just in case, it, for some reason, if you have some custom trail pack or if you've modified the framework in some other way that we, we can't anticipate, um, during runtime, if some, if some trail pack is waiting for some other uh, event f for some yeah, period of time, you can configure that timeout. Those two checks there. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, you can just you don't even have to install any ORM trail pack um, if you just if you have some, you know, it, it's it, depending on what it's integrating with. If it's integrating directly with, you're using like direct database driver possibly, or some other REST service. What, how are you integrating with this other service currently? Uh, okay. Yeah. So th so this application could just talk directly with that. Um, that integration could either be inside the application logic itself, or it could be split out into a trail pack and then loaded in. It just, it depends. Um, the, the, if you're looking for a way, my laptop likes to shut off. If you're looking for a way to get the nice, like, generated footprint uh, things, then th there's a footprint spec um, in the, uh, it's called footprint service. And essentially you just implement like eight or nine you implement these eight methods 
in footprint service. And when you load in that trail pack, it loads in that service. And any other uh, pack that makes use of that service will automatically hook into it. So for example, like trail pack happy, uh, if I load up just some code real quick. So this happy has a footprint controller. And OK, so for example, when, you, when I post to something, it's going to call create and have a route config that, a happy route config essentially that maps post to um, some, some path to have it end up here. And then this footprint controller create just basically does some validation and then proxies it over to footprint service.create. So all you'd really have to do is if you wanted to like hook up some existing, uh, you know, any sort of existing persistence layer to uh, the REST server, you really just have to implement one of these footprint services and then you're in business. This, will, this, this pack will automatically call this service. Is that clicking? We, we can talk more about it later if, if yeah, that's, that's just how I'm en envisioning it in my mind, but it's, it's hard to convey kind of hand-waving. Hand Question in the back? Yeah, um, so some of that is far out. Uh, some of it actually isn't. There actually exists already a GraphQL adapter for Waterline. Um, there's also, so there's two sides of GraphQL. One is you can use it to, to communicate with other services with your app. The probably more typical side is the browser wants to send GraphQL type formatted requests to your server and then it knows how to deal with those. I would, I would actually put that more in the category of like the uh, JSON API type, uh, type use case where with GraphQL at least, it's really just the type of, of request that you just need, you need to parse and then handle it. Um, Relay, I don't really know how Relay is going to work. Um, have they released it yet? Does Relay exist yet? Uh, I know they announced it last year, but um, yeah, th that kind of stuff is, those are integrations that we will we will probably be very interested in once, once you know, a, 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 like a reference impl implementation is out. But GraphQL is already available to some extent. Um, there's another project called Strapi. Has anyone ever heard of Strapi? S T R A P I. Um, it's actually built on Sales. It's uh, it's done by a team uh, out of France, and it's a it's sort of like visual. Uh, it's 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 almost like WordPress. I hate to. Uh, I hate to sully like the name of Node with, with comparing it to WordPress, but um, uh, it's it gives you like a visual kind of admin interface on top of Sales, um, and allows you to build some of your application visually in the browser. Um, they they actually wrote a GraphQL driver for for Waterline. Uh, it's pretty cool. Other questions? Other questions? All right, I think think that's it. Great, thanks guys. <laughs>